For this presentation, I will basically be sort of uh, inviting you into a, a moment in my research, my thoughts and uh, all the kind of threads of uh, discussions and conversations that I've been having so far. And in that you'll sense sort of uh, the sen sense of concern uh, around the built environment. Um, and a, fr a frustration I've kind of always had with how the process of building is the one thing that s sort of seems to continue regardless what's happening in people's lives. And that kind of presented a, a sort of direct, like a correlation between catastrophe and the process of building. And so architecture um, as building and practice became quite central in, um, in the way I look at things in my artistic research. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically read out text and also introduce these moments that I feel um, can be really represented in writing and can be really told. So You'll have moments of video and sound coming in, troubling sometimes what I said, contradicting certain things. And I'm perfectly fine with that because I'm still looking for a vocabulary, um, a spatial vocabulary, let's say, and a spatial practice that is um, encompassing of what happens in life and maybe something that hap that. I guess guides us outside of the terror of the state and, um, you know, state-induced catastrophes, I would say. Um, so here we go. First off, uh, one of the first conversations I was having was with a, a very dear friend of mine and also a critical, a cultural critic, Egbert Alejandro Martina, and we started off with this uh, question around how um, sp cities and certain spaces, let's say urban spaces, uh, seem to become increasingly uninhabitable. Uh, and that that also comes with a sense of a climate that whenever cities grow, there is a sense of uninhabitability that's also kind of enforced on everything. Um, and so the question of uninhabit uninhabitability is becoming more and more pressing amidst increase, increasing the extreme weather events um, that threaten an human and non-human life. Uh, African nations and small island nations in the Pacific and Caribbean in particular are vulnerable to becoming uninhabitable due to global warming, rising sea levels, coastal erosion, and failing potable water supplies. Architects and urban planning planners are at the forefront of imagining what a sustainable future might look like. Architectural drawings and the master plans uh, drawn up by uh, designers make a future potential as already real and provide pathways to bring it into physical being. However, architecture as an exercise of power in concrete form is far from innocent. And, virtue, and a virtuous practice. The idea that it can offer a cure for a global ecological crisis asks us to consider the specific and unspoken uh, techno-utopian imaginaries that animate and shape the visions of the proposed better futures. In the search for solutions, an, imp as impo an, an important question seems to remain unasked. What exactly is being sustained with uh, prepositions of sustainable architecture? that continue, of course, to center architectural practice as something, well, as architectural intervention, as something that fixes things. Uh, sustainability, I guess, in this conversation, we were looking at it as something that sustains a certain aesthetic sensibility or climate, meaning it often ends up sustaining the reproduction of existing social relations. Sustainability's power works through its promise of turning everything green and as such fit to support life. 
The rise of green prisons, that is prisons that comply with green construction industry standards, complicates an easy equation between green and habitability. The, green of the, the greening of the site of carceral power per excellence tells us that what is propagated as sustainable cannot be separated from the creation and the continuation of the uninhabitable. Lance Hosey uh, notes that the very concepts of ecology and sustainability carry within them an aesthetic mandate. The sustainable, and by extension the habitable, is, part, is apart from the green, clean, efficient, smart, intelligent, and each of these descriptors perpetuates an, an ableist norm. A sustainable future, it seems, has been set up with what is, ready in place, what is already in place. So whose future worldview exactly is being sustained? Hosey asks us to consider whether smarter tools merely make us better at making things worse. We agree with Hosey's assertion that we have yet to face the underlying social and cultural circumstances that caused the crisis. So we were not particularly interested in offering descriptions of crisis, but rather in analyzing how catastrophe, which is for, to us the onset and continuation of uninhabitable conditions, and the architecture's quest for newness as are interrelated and possibly inseparable. And I think we, we've started to, through the research, um, I've started to sort of offer up an analysis as a record of conversation and progress that may offer us ways to imagine how we can live otherwise. We are interested in newness because the descriptor, descriptor of new is being attached to spatial arrangements. For example, one example would be the, the UN's urban agenda. And for example, slogans in Khartoum. This image here is uh, from right after the, right after the civil disobedience, this disobedience kicked in um, in 2019 and the emptiness of the, capturing the emptiness of the streets. And during this time, there were slogans that sort of started to pop up around a new Sudan that are perceived as breaking with what has been done before. Yet despite their claims to newness, and here of course I refer to, for example, the urban agenda and the slogans of the new Sudan, um, despite their claims to newness, what was being offered as new is essentially rehearsals of well-worn policies and practices. So what else is there when one is tired of both the old and the new? And <clears throat> newness uh, evokes a sense of optimism, I feel, and promise in its depiction of changing constellations of labor, mobility in global cap and mobility in global capitalism. But new here allows for a circumvention of accountability that leads to an apolitical approach to vulnerability. Climate change makes our lives vulnerable. However, climate change is but one among several causes of vulnerability for Afri African and small island nations. Climate change compounds existing vulnerabilities that are being produced by continual interaction of political, economic, and social processes. African nations and small island nations are bearing the brunt of climatic shocks and projects of development in their lands, as well as their bodies. The old problems remain unresolved, and it has made us become, or it has made us come to the realization that bearing the brunt is a condition of the new. To put it otherwise, the cost of responsibility towards the environment is the slow devastation of black and brown geographies. So 
Space making is generally speaking a practice foreclosed by architecture and urban planning and their investment in permanency. But again, we're not interest, so much interested in what is new in these prepositions that make an appeal to novelty. There is nothing new about them. Rather, we're interested in work that, the work that the new does in the process of space making itself. Permanency has extended foreclosure onto the future. As a result, both new in the new urban agenda, for example, and the new Sudan, attest to different views of a foreclosed future. By contrast, we suggest that the narratives, for example, in New Sudan and the UN's new urban agenda, stress the ways in which people have to face injurious conditions when they are forced to endure, bear, and sustain the impact of sociocultural discursive ideals and processes that further the narrative of economic growth, yet render its citizens precarious. That is, they are coerced into becoming participants in a world govern governed by capital, whose option options are always limited to low-wage shift work. These were archival images I had found in the Sudan records, uh, volume 13. And these are basically uh, documentation from British officers that were stationed in Sudan at the time of the colonial rule. And this one was an interesting moment, uh, two images side by side in the page, one indicating an early road, or named an early road, and the other a modern road. And these moments, of course, kind of um, are sort of thresholds, that sort of epochs of, you know, thinking and how the world sort of gradually changed um, its way uh, of looking at the built environment as well. In 2019, the term newness resurfaced in the public sphere. Uh, post-revolution in Sudan. It's okay. And it was sometimes fused with certain poetics when people started to chant, we shall build a new Sudan. And it's coming from a poem by Mahjub Sharif called We Shall Build It. We shall build it, that which we dream of daily. Building Building a new Sudan here is what we identify the tensions where space-making facilities, facilitates, sorry, holding catastrophe in place rather than holding space for a human ecology or life. And so, and so an idea of building that comes attached to newness suggests a restructuring of the urban scape that is presumed to bring about a cultural and political reset as the only way by which we as Sudanese people get to move on from catastrophes that we have to continue building. Ironically, as we chant, and for example, in social media, we reposted and shared, and you know, as we called our families, we at times even believed the promise of building as change. But while we were doing that, the inflation steadily was rising making the money one makes hourly depleted and thus life on a day-to-day -day basis almost impossible for the majority. And this marks that catastrophe which hides behind a new Sudan has not by any definition ended. This story of recurring economic brokenness that happens in the wake of predictions of the booming of African cities is the idea of the following each time newness is invoked, it repeats and consolidates uh, racial regulati regulatory formations on land and life. أنا ماشي راجع 
לביאות. ביאות תפתח לי אוואל מאלו. מנרא תבול הזול מנו. לחתת על הדאי חיר למאלף אג'אבק שינו. לביאות בג'יהן פי יום אינגיד דורש טוואל דפרי אלבאב וחוש אינגיד הלל מרת אטלב זי נסם מעדי שם לאוש לקוש لقطحت نوم النائمين للبار للحيشان تبوش إن شوف تتجري على هدم في محلها الشوف في ترسم تنجهني حتى بالإسم تندهني عبان New architecture can only deliver a repetition of the conditions that brought people into conditions of poverty, into living in, to in toxic environments. That's what is always done in the first place, and by default can never change. Things are always changing, though, but for the worst. I know that sounds pessimistic, but it is what it is. We are. <laughs> We are always asked to wait until building finishes before we address issues that people face. We're asked to wait while the building process continues. Our problems are never urgent enough to hold the new objects creating our surroundings. Sharam Khosravi argues that prolonged waiting not only engenders new vulnerabilities, but also aggravates vulnerabilities that are already present. revealing socio-political regulations that result in an unequal distribution of risk and hope. Waiting seems to capture this obscurity that term endurance seems to impose on situations that are continuously catastrophic. Waiting suggests a notion of time. This also reflects the process of architectural building. The status quo is to keep building and we wait until building is finished. The structures are being built despite 
Here, waiting does not refer to delays in building construction, but as an imposed state of suspension in which one is forced to wait for things to get better. Much of black life, Charles Davis mentions that much of black life has always had to make do with what was left over by industrial modernism, a black existential orientation toward architectural practice, A black existential orientation toward architectural practice might resuscitate the strategic value of populations so often overlooked by postmodernist theorists who struggle to maintain the pan-European character of Western architecture in an increasingly global society. Many times during my writing, I always think that I have a feeling that I long for an opening. Because I usually write amidst a great deal of strain and think about next steps of uh, immigration, weighing up pros and cons of existing in certain territories, of the impending demands of immigration office for an integration process, and what, is, what this will entail in terms of negotiations of time, articulations of personhood, and sometimes encroachments on my dignity. I have to wonder in relation to the movement of our bodies across borders and terrains, what spatialized acts account, for example, for what happens to us while we wait? The emotional labor, the emotional labor of weighthood. For the many attempts to hold time for oneself, the urgency to depart from this suspended temporality of waiting and finding a place in a moment where one isn't dealing with all of this, holding time troubles the linearity of time. And it has become something I think about, time has become something I think about when thinking of spatiality and it has become intertwined with spatial acts. To me, spatial acts are inherently temporal acts. It is thus a constituent of healing sometimes from discomforts. And interestingly enough, I was recently commissioned to talk about healing sites. Um, which made us all, made a sort of invite onto looking at the sites where catastrophes has, have unfolded in the past. And of course, troubled this idea of me thinking about architecture as a climate of catastrophe in itself. And I thought about how one carries also um, some of the discomforts and the remnants of catastrophe in their bodies and wonders through cities. And as one wanders through the city of Amsterdam, the ramification of this labor, this emotional labor, are carried, of course, in body and mind, an illustration of the geography of a bigger sort of dis bigger discomfort. Maybe in the context of identifying healing sites, it can be traced that political catastrophic events transfer to the body via different transmissions and forms shaping the material condition under which one navigates possibilities for holding time as a spatial act. With that said, the harm done by way of the body, memory, rem through memory, uh, remembrances and otherwise, can also be identified as moving and meandering through the built environment. If we are to then embark on a journey of healing, do we follow wounds? Do they carve us out a route to pursue? And is healing then a process of motion? If so, healing then is surely a symbi symbiosis of action, of tracing. When we are moving, what are we moving towards or from? Where are we? This where? Is it a terrain, an open field, a forest, a sea? Is it the soil? And I thought 
that I'll continue meandering through the ideas and implications and potentials of the proposed, of proposed sites, for example, that trouble lines of spatial interventions. That when I look at sites, I'm also able to look at our bodies. I'm also able to look at, I'm also able to trouble time. <clears throat> and not focus on particular matter, material interventions, but rather on geographic terrains of wounds, that which is in need of healing, for example. My aim here is not to be sort of uh, comprehensive, but I think that if we keep moving through certain locations and ideas and time frames and situatedness of certain moments of uh, project interventions, architectural, you know, framing our ideas in, in uh, architectural, architecture as intervention, I wanted to always sort of highlight geographies of this discomfort as well that I carry with. Uh, architecture. And to me, that discomfort is the wandering n nature of wounds beyond the enclosures of site interventions or site specific interventions. And it plays a significant role, I feel, in drawing alternative principles of spatialization um, in European urbanscapes and elsewhere. So I started to think what are conditions that mark certain sites uh, as being in need of healing in the first place. And also there must be, of course, uh, a reason why we desire to sort of heal and what this healing means also. Um, framing healing as an act of restoration, I think that architecture, when we think about it through architectural interventions, we're always introducing this notion of restoration that, were, that, was, that implies that was, what was already there before catastrophes hit is kind of superior to the current state. And I think that's a kind of fallacy or a trap that we fall into because the previous state is also what generated the catastrophe. So restoring it automatically creates the continuation of what I mentioned earlier to be the uninhabitable continuation of exhaustion of bodies, which was, of course, also mentioned in previous, previous uh, presentations. And, of course, creates this suspension of time, us being stuck in weighthood. Um, <clears throat> so, what are the conditions that mark a site as being in need of healing in the first place? And there must be a reason, of course, uh, behind the desire to restore condition to a previous state. Framing healing as an act of restoration reveals the most obvious and essential tenets underlying this urgency. That first, cure centers damage as prerequisite, a, prem a premise that is very telling of the modern Western episteme that continues to inform the architectural practice globally. Um, Further reflective of this epistemology is the process of localizing the harm entirely within enclosures. So we always keep talking about catastrophes through visiting a site, through presenting a site in an enclosure, uh, and operating as if each environment were its own, it's an own, it's its own ecosystem. Second, the notion of restoration is grounded on the presupposition of an original state of being relying on the belief that what existed before is superior to what exists currently. It thus seeks to return what is damaged to that former state of being. Identifying healing sites implies a precursor of insistence on the tracing of the route uh, of wandering wounds, as if there was a pre-state of wellness, of wholeness, of terrains that were fam what we are familiar with. Um, I thought I'll keep showing you visuals, but there's no time to do that. Um, so I thought maybe to close with sort of an open-ended uh, constellation of images. Well, sound, let's say, better sound, I think, yeah. yeah. Maybe leave it at that.
I want to whisper with all honesty of that thing that drags me through the world, through empty deserts of the world. I let it guide me through the delusion. I stop once to call upon the ones I knew, once with persistence, and once with a long breath. <sighs> once a cry, once a scream, then I continue walking through the delusion again when I notice from the corner of my eye a line that follows, ready to build all around me. There is the city in here in my hands. I want to write on windows with these lines. Oh, and in all the openings, even the ones I don't see. I want to write on the walls my name, my history. All that has not been comprehended. I want to say it to my neighbor and friend and maybe brothers of all that hasn't been told in the book. I think that should be it for now. Yeah.